So these are some of the directives. Uh, adopt modular development acquisition approaches. This actually has a whole document of how you even contract for modular development. And it actually identifies that in the past, in traditional uh, acquisition approaches, you go and find, you put out an RFP, you spend a lot of time going after that, and one vendor gets it, and then you go through a year and a half, two year cycle of building this thing out, and then 90% of it fails, right? 90, 95% of software development fails. With modular development, you build small pieces, which means you can contract small pieces out, and if something fails, it's just a loss of six weeks or eight weeks instead of a year and a half. So it allows for this much more rapid iterative approach, which already is happening out in the real world. Uh, in the, especially in the last few years, things are rapidly changing. So there's a lot of uh, information like this, uh, which we have linked from the uh, fedifm.org site that talks about how you actually go about this uh, approach of uh, modular uh, development. So uh, the, the, the three-tiered architecture, I'm jumping back to that White House document, but we used Legos now. So the concept of data being neutral, being accessible as a bottom layer, a data service, the traffic cop that says, here's how you get to the data. So it's going to ask a question, who are you and what are you getting to? And what do you need to do to this? Do you want to just view it? Or do you want to edit it? Are you looking at standards? Are you looking at secure data, non-secure data? And then you build apps on top of that. App A, App B, App C were the first three proofs of concept that were developed. And you can go all the way to Z and beyond. And these things plug together naturally. And this goes back to standards, but we want to keep the standards very simple here. Even though I'm very involved in building smart, and uh, I also often struggle with the complexity of IFC and, and, and the things that are happening there, that there's a lot of theoretical discussions of how things can happen, but there's no simple place to start. And Kobe is a good example of where you can start simply, but if you can point to a developer and say, here's how you plug your app into this data service to get to that data, and you need to know nothing about BIM, you need to know nothing about CAF and CMS, you need to know nothing about FedIFM or Max, here's the RESTful web services of how you get a list of spaces. That's really all they want from a minimum viable product approach. And more importantly, you want to be able to unplug it again. So modular approaches on the left, monolithic, single, large applications on the right with data trapped in the middle. It's not that one is better than the other, but this, these two can actually coexist. But we need to be able, still need to get to the data on the, on the larger applications. So the question is, how do we get it? And there's obviously APIs and, and ways to do that. So it's going to be a, a hybrid uh, approach, obviously, because the world that we live in today is somewhere in between these two, but the technology out there outside of the facilities world that we live in is already on the left side, and it's, it's a disruption that's already happening with all the other technologies out there. So if we don't move into there, we're, we're going to be behind. I, I think a, a key thing, and again, I'm, I'm not speaking for the entire federal government, I'm not speaking for the DOD as a whole, though if we follow the president's budget, or I'm sorry, the president's directive, um, you know, if you're in that scenario where you, where for your system to work for us, that green box, the data layer, has to be inside your system, it's a non-starter for us in the MHS, for where we're going with our CMS and CAFM. So, and that's one thing that I want to point out, again, relative to where we're going and moving forward. If your system has to operate in that scenario, we're not a good client for you. I haven't seen a business software on the show software that does not have an API. I have seen dozens. I don't see a single one that does not have I, I saw custom developed software like Demons or the others that did not have an API because they never planned to do it. But you know, take any commercial Calvin CMS software, they all have web based API services, etc. Yeah, and, and I, I agree with you. What but what we are doing that I'm, from our standpoint that I want to make sure we're clear on is when we move forward and start moving out on some of this, if your solution is you're going to take our data and you're going to absorb it into your system and manipulate it in your system, that's a non-starter for us. We, we want to make sure that the data control stays with us so when I say having that, that green box inside your system, it's not one of these, we don't want a solution where you take our data, pull it in, play with it, and occasionally you share it back with us. That's not the scenario we're looking for, which is 
different than a lot of people operate today. But I agree with you on the API thing. APIs are new to the federal government. I mean, God knows the effort we went through trying to do some of this stuff over the last couple of years. It's, it's been a learning experience for us, for sure. Yeah, It's not a technology challenge to actually open up APIs and make the data accessible. It's, it's a lot of time it's a business decision. And obviously there's proprietary and IP and all that stuff mixed in with it. But uh, we feel that this creates more opportunities for the industry. It makes the data um, ownership going back to who needs to own it to be able to move it into the future. And um, there's obviously going to be need to be a lot of testing and discussions. That's why we have you here because we're moving forward with this, but we want to make sure it works with what you're providing. We want to see who's out there that's even willing to think about this because we've had experience with other owners in situations like this where there's been a lot of pushback from certain parts of the industry and others jump right in. Um, uh, so it's that type of a message that we're at right now. So this modular versus monolithic, if the wheel falls off of, of that uh, ambulance on the left, you go get another wheel and you plug it in. If the wheel falls off on the right, you throw that toy away and you buy another toy. Uh, and the, the Fed IFM structure basically is saying, here's how the pieces fit in. If you fit into that, then we, then we can play, basically. Michael, you had a question? Yeah, uh, Russ, um, uh, all of this has been driven by White House policy. In two years and 14 days, we're going to have a new president. <laughs> I, you know, I mean, things could change. That's, that's why I said, you know, things are unforeseen to me. But I, I think there are certain things that I don't care what political party you're in, um, the industry is moving a certain way. And for us to go a different way than industry would be odd. Um, so I, I think the key thing, and one of the things I said earlier too, is from our perspective in the MHS, we, we've got to solve a problem. Uh, while we are doing it because we have to do it, as we started looking at this and started working through the proof of concept and looking at the problems we have, we, we don't need to do it anymore because we were told we have to. I, I really, for what we need to do and where things are going in the industry, I don't think we have any choice, regardless of who gets elected. And I, I mean, I, that's a good point, because, I mean, it is a reality, but on this particular issue, I don't see that changing. Right. So it's Jeb Bush with the Ad Common Core and the Facility. <laughs> <laughs> Well, really, what well, we should we should be We're driving. We're not going to touch that. In this <laughs> we should be driving this as an industry. We shouldn't be waiting for the White House to tell us to do this. We know this technology is out there. We all know that. We see it all the way around us. This disruption is already happening out there. It's up to us to make it to make it work. Yeah, the White House did not yeah. invent it. Russ's point, Russ's point is key because what happens in a large procurement is somebody wins it. Right. They go for five years. They largely fail. The Navy, when they let in 2008, was it $30 million for data, just for, just for moving the data to the new, the new standard? Right. The and, there's, and there's a whole industry surrounding that. That's the other problem, that the, yeah. the business and cultural issues around that, that procurement is built around that, consulting services are built around that, and so it's, it's going to be a difficult discussion in some areas. But if we don't drive that, then we're basically not servicing right. what we should be doing. Really. You, you know, the value in what the White House put out was, uh, as, as John said, not that they solved the problem the world just didn't, didn't know how to fix. The value was it forced the leadership to understand they have to think differently than they well, used to. Well, there's a lot to. of value in that. I mean, yeah. even if you're doing something because you should and not because you're told, there's a great deal of value in the right. Right. So I think the availability of technology in our personal life, I think you said that, that if I can find a Starbucks, if I can have, uh, find a VAB box, our smartphones have these small, lightweight apps. The data is just there. We I mean, don't even think about where to get the data anymore, so that's pushing, I would say, the workplace to catch up to what we all have available. Right, our that's, that's what's driving it, yeah. There's, no, there's no choice, really. There's that, no trading involved right. or anything like that. Right. Is this webinar going beyond uh, 330? We're, we're, we're still on, yeah, we're we're as long as we want it to be. So I know you wanted to finish up, but I just want to plant the seed for a little discussion later. Are these um, items that Russ and Pomona brought up, security, data portability, agility, 
exclusive to the federal agencies, or are you are you running into them in your private life, your commercial <laughs> life? Sorry. Okay, so I mean, this is not just a federal, you know, government issue. No. Okay. But, but the paradigm shift is that a typical capital CMMS system operates on the data within the system, even if you're hosting the system, even if it, if it software as a service uh, or client hosted. As so opposed that, to a federated, as it's opposed to a federated, federated right. that. And, yeah. so, and so the architecture for many of the, and I can tick off five or six vendors that are on our committee, because we're, we're vendor neutral in the, in the NIMS committee, I can tick off five or six vendors that are outside that paradigm now and have to reconfig to, to, to work inside. They can go in and get the data, but they will bring it out, operate it, and replace the data. And while the data may be internally compatible, if everybody's using the same cookie standard and the same data structure, the same architecture, it still has to be worked within their system to do that. And then the other problem you have with that is legacy data left in the system. Because now you've got data that's outside the system because the, the app has to operate it, right. okay? And so is there any legacy data that cannot be outside the system? Right. And that's, a, that's another issue. Right. Yeah, I, I, they're, they're fundamentally from my perspective, and again, this is my perspective, there's two key things why I keep focusing on making sure that green box is outside whatever the tool is. Yeah. One is an efficiency factor that I, I believe we have. The other reason is I, I am, I, I've had so many problems with security trying to get stuff to work that I'm so sensitive to security. And if, if we go where we're trying to go with this, and you have to take all of our data and move it outside our platform, I've got a massive security issue that I know I can't get by my guys to make this work. So, and that's probably the bigger of the two reasons uh, as to why I keep harping on this. And I'm trying to make sure that everybody's clear, if you want to work with us in the future, that green box has got to be outside the black box, whatever your tool is. Is, is one of the prototypes that you've established because one of the one of the critiques you'll see in this data model or this three-tier architecture that we run into all the time when we implement things like this is performance. Because you've isolated the data from uh, a mid-tier to make things performant. So it, 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 you should definitely look at prototypes and scaling it. You, you know, it's funny you say that because honestly, you know, the SEPs, we said we finally got everything decoupled. Our, our guys that it's a GOTS program and you know the folks that work on it have been working on it forever. Um, when we said we want to decouple it, we spent months not with the technology issue but convincing them that we could make that it, the performance work because it's, it's a critical issue. I think some of the things we have done to test it, it, it may, what's not 100% clear in my mind is the scale of what we're trying to do, right? I think one of the benefits in what we're trying to do, though, actually allows us to compartmentalize some of this information, whereas the, the one black box for everything right now uh, actually causes some performance issues, too, so there's sort of a give and take. But another issue that we have uh, in the federal government, um, well, this probably applies to anybody, too, is we have some locations that, honestly, their bandwidth is terrible, right? So I've got some places sitting in Africa that I'm going to put a web-based solution out there, and they're like, "What are you talking about?" <laughs> you know, um, they can get connected to the web, but you can't. You know, the pipe's really small. So, one of the things that we've been looking at is just to solve that problem is a good virtual desktop solution, so I don't have to push so much through their pipe. And it, you know, just happens to be I don't know what agency in the federal government needed it, but somebody needed a good virtual desktop. Max happened to develop that. It was now available to me, and it's one of the best virtual desktops we've found inside the federal government. So for my locations, like you know, in remote Africa, they can get a decent enough connection to do a virtual desktop, but they don't have to worry about all the power and passing too much through that. So maybe not the best solution, but it, it's you know part of the the, the kit of tools to solve it. 
the performance thing has been a central part to what we're testing on Max as well too. And we're l we're looking at the architecture. We're re-looking at the architecture now that we've finished the proof of concept, and we're looking for being able to test, for example, the, the Esri connection that we had or other vendors. Okay, what's really going on here? The flip side of it is a lot of the performance related to this is we're looking at very granular level. For the the, the what we showed is instead of pushing a whole model back and forth or pieces of the model, it's a really kind of a transaction that we just want this piece. And the amount of data that's actually running through here, even though it's large, it's really peanuts compared to a lot of the other big data things that are already happening outside of the building industry with technologies today. So I think a lot of this performance stuff, and there are strategies of how to pull things offline and everything, but we need to have that dialogue and we need to be able to stress test it. So those, that kind of input would be invaluable. One, one of the things we do need to stress test yet that we haven't done in any, any degree, and this goes back to, I think, what we were talking a little bit about a, a little bit earlier, is in some cases you get in some of our buildings, you know, where our facility managers are, there's a lot of dead spots for Wi-Fi, right? So um, it, one of the things we're going to be looking for is people that have good solutions as to how we take some of that, you know, not all of the data, but just the data I need to go into that mechanical room, do a couple of things, and then, uh, you know, basically replicate that back to the system once I get back to a Wi-Fi solution set. So I, I, all of these things are in play, and that's that's why I said from the beginning, from our perspective, everything's on the table, but we are trying to make clear after this testing sort of what the shot group is, where we're heading down, so that people that are interested in working with us have some idea as to whether we're going left or right. Right. So the Fed IFM structure, I, I won't go back to this. And the, the important thing is we don't want to glue, if you guys have seen the Lego movie, we don't want this stuff glued together. We want to be able to pull it apart and bring it back together. We want to build stuff that we can't anticipate we need today. That's the other part about this scalability and modularity to kind of go into the future. Um, and it's not just A, B, C, and D. We're going, we're going all the way to Z, basically, and beyond. It's really about where we don't know what's coming down as far as a need goes. And as we get into more complex needs of facilities, especially as you start aggregating data and doing things that uh, are not possible today, we want to plan for that future. And we don't. We want to break this dependency. It just does not work for what DOD, MHS, and other owners needs are. And, and I, would, I would argue, granted I'm arguing from a bias, I don't sit in your seat, but I don't think dependency works for the vendor community either. It works for a select few who happen to get a contract here and there, but um, you know, what was said earlier is my experience, no matter how good your tool is, we ask you to do more with it than it can do, and that the maximum life of our relationship usually is about five years because everybody's mad at everybody after that. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, a little bit more of the technical aspects of it. So we have the max production environment on the right, the max platform, and within that we have some data that's 100% public even, like the 1691 database that we recommended go into a web service. This is an equipment database of the standards that used to be hard to get to. It's already accessible within Max, and it's going to be 100% public in the master tables, whatever. And they also have their applications. The reason we almost failed this effort or put a failure report in in June is because we did not have a sandbox. They, they, um, we, we went through iterations of Max building somewhat of a sandbox, but it wasn't enough to the point where we could bring outside development teams and do things with it. Uh, in June, July of this year, we shifted gears, got them to actually. Uh, use Amazon Web Services as the place to park the sandbox, which allows us to build applications. The whole Fed IFM testing environment is there, and the, the application development happens there with redacted data of the facilities that I showed you, so we can do the testing with a development team. And then it goes through the security review process. So we have this whole pipeline. Some of the current Fed IFM applications, like the SEPs and the 1691, are already in production and have been for over a year. Other ones that were in the prototype in the last two or three months have already moved through the security and are in there. And there's some parts of the proof of concept that are still in process being reviewed right now. So we wanted to test the whole range of all the way into production to new applications going in. So hopefully that at least portrays that when I say we're looking to work with multiple people, that we're serious about this because we're, we're trying, we've got the sandbox out there and we are trying to work through increasing the efficiency as to how we move from the sandbox, get past the firewall and get it into production for use. And in my mind, the only reason we would do that 
uh, is if we intend to work with more than one, one group of folks. So I, I hope that at least gives some confidence to the industry that we're serious about. This is a broader spectrum of what we want to deal with. And what Mike was talking about earlier about the uh, uh, FedRAMP compliance and the security, that, that's all happening in this process. There's a kind of a, a well-documented process that's been built up as part of this effort as well. Mike, do you want to throw anything about this as well? Well, this actually gets back to the changing nature of the technology, too. So when you have the three layers there, right? At the data layer, one of our huge concerns was that we have all this data going out to our vendor community that then retain the data inside their internal systems. It then gets really <coughs> exploited. We, DOD or the federal agencies, don't know that our own data has now been exfiltrated, right? So by retaining the data internally to us, we now can start to see that our data's been compromised and or been exfiltrated. At the same time, the tools to us to then now do security analysis of the data itself, those tools have now come online. And we deal these cases called the local <coughs> scanning system. Um, then the next layer up, the, the data transport layer, same thing. Now we've got tools that we can watch our packets. They're encrypted. And we can see that it's going to the right IP address and there's not somebody that's a man in the middle taking stuff. It's going where it needs to go. And then lastly, that security web app. Now, we now have got the software um, analysis tool so that we can look at that software and see that there's not rabbits and black holes and all other ways for the data to be um, manipulated with that web interface. So all three of those combined now have come online in the last year and a half in particular. So that is, again, the, the, the changing nature of the piece, knowing the old way of protecting data in the IT systems doesn't work. We at least now have this next generation working today. It's moving very, very fast. And if you're not familiar with that, um, on the software side, I heard you no wasp and scat tools at all. So is everybody familiar with the software content analysis um, process? To NIST and DOD. So there's a, a tool up there called the SCAP tool. So when we want to check software and or hardware software configurations on machines, I'll uh, run the SCAP tool against the application, against the servers and the um, mobile devices. Uh, there's a NIST version that's applicable to all organizations. There's a DOD version. So if you're DOD, just let it, just give us a call and we'll make sure that you catch up right there. Same thing on the civilian. Best practice of WASP is the um, organization that um, puts out all the current years uh, top 10 um, software flaws, best practices. So, again, I highly recommend you become familiar with that community as well. That's where we're kind of coming back to your thought about the contracting language and the comments and the standards. That is going to be coming down the road. You're going to have to demonstrate that you have a contract cyber risk management plan in place. If you protect your data and our data, if you follow these best practices, then oh yeah, we're going to check your stuff against these tools. And Thank you. so when, when Mike when when Mike says that one of the reasons we have he's a consultant over at DOD I and E. So he's in the loop more than we are in our office about from a facilities community where the IT stuff is going and where the security stuff is going. So we figured the best way to get that incorporated into what we're doing is go straight to the source. Um, and so when Mike talks about the DOD going there, um, he, he's in the thick of it. So related to security as well. Sir, um, I know I've been wanting to make this drag, but um, can I, I, I've got to leave the floor. Can we make sure that we get to the, how we can engage? Yeah, this? you can. Let's see how we're doing on time. So give me about another 15 minutes. Okay, I'll, let me run through this and, and we'll get to that, yeah. Because that's an important question for all of us. We, uh, we want to hear from each one of you how you think. And this is moving very quickly. We're going to the next phase and we've been talking to other agencies, even things that are happening in the next few weeks. So we want to hear what you think might some, be some immediate steps or comments of what, you, what, you, what we've and, shown and, you. And timeline meaning this will evolve over the next 12 months, but our goal is to start the next sprint uh, in four weeks. So. I mean, we're not talking about starting something new in, you know, six to 12 months. We will, progressively this will move forward, but we're talking about doing the next focus sprint in four weeks. Right. Can I interrupt with one question? That's so important. 
after you uh, started the sandbox, how many uh, third party apps were developed? By I'm getting into that, yeah, yeah. So the, the goal again is if we take the decoupled data and you look at the types of users, right now the problem is that the executives, for example, don't know how to use BIM, can't get into the BIM. There's customers like uh, patients that might need to do wayfinding. There's technical teams. So everybody needs different parts of the data. And when you decouple it like that, it means you can build specific interfaces for each of those users and make it simple if you need to get to it. Uh, we have ERDs, we have a data dictionary, we have a basic backbone, as we call it, about FedIFM. We can share this, um, and this is not final. We're still looking for input if you have, it's very much based on Kobe, um, it's within extensions of what we were seeing as needed from, for the life cycle. Um, and we're able to pull, this is going to your question, Michael. Uh, we pulled parts of that structure out. This is for the work order module. Then we could hand it off to teams and say, Here's what we want you to build to. You don't need to know anything about BIM. You don't need to know anything about IFC. You don't need to know anything about Fed IFM. But you need to understand these are the fields that we're working with, and we want you to build based on the structure. And we want you. And we gave them a wireframe like this. So, three sprints, three proofs of concept. The first two were done by teams that were familiar with Max and Fed IFM. And then the third sprint, we intentionally said, we could have done it ourselves, but we said, okay, we want to go outside of this whole internal team and give it to an outside developer that had never touched any of this and see, can they build a work order application in four weeks for $20,000? That was a challenge. And this is not a final version. There's a lot to it, but they actually did a single developer, a single developer with about two or three people. Um, so what they did is they actually, um, the, the first proof of concept one was three, three weeks, two weeks of prep time. The, the second one, and this is what they built in, in three, three to four weeks, the first version of it, with multiple screens, multiple fields, the, the drill in, using parts of other things. And then the next one was to also, while they were doing that, we said expose the development environment, give us the restful web services so we can get to data and give other developers. We pointed Esri to this. This is a simple connection. There's no development of code, basically. You just pulling RESTful Web Services. Esri, instead of giving the data to Esri, we said, we have the data here. Can you get that data and show it in your interface? And they were able to do that pretty quickly. The, and this is their, their view as well of the same data. And it's all open GitHub. You can go get it. Yeah, well, the, there's a longer, yeah, it is there, but we could, we could go through that later. Um, the, and then we, what Russ was talking about earlier, then we wanted a, a, a second proof of concept where we wanted to take that same interface and be able to switch agencies and say, okay, now this is for MHS, but now we want to flip it over to Smithsonian. What would that look like? And can we use the same code and just shift, shift interface? And that was done in about four weeks. The third one is the most interesting one that I, that I talked about. So this team actually finished, not only did they finish in four weeks, they finished before the allocated time. They said, we're done, what else should we do? We said, keep on going, spend a few more days, give us a report, and they were able to complete that. And that proved that it was actually possible to do with outside development teams. We also, that did, know the that did not know the system, yes. They did not know anything about the system. They did not know anything about BIM or BIM standards or building smart, nothing. And this is one thing that I've been pushing for building smart. We need development environments where we can pull in the best developers, no matter what they know about BIM or not know about BIM and build stuff on top of it. We asked them to expose their whole development process, their scrum board. We were watching them day by day. They had their targets. We were watching what was going on. They had to adjust some things and move things around. So we were able to track, and we have a huge history of what they bumped into, but they were able to complete it regardless. So this is the 4D pipeline team that says, able to complete the work order proof concept, time to spare, no prior knowledge, able to use Fed IFM structure and sandbox. It was clear enough for them to complete the four-week sprint. Um, so this is the difference between Agile and Waterfall. I'm not going to go into that. I think all of you guys know about this. But we are definitely in an Agile mode of rapidly building stuff, throwing things away that don't work, even being able to declare that we're not ready for Max, which we did in June, which creates a, a very nice dynamic to say, let's make this work. Um, this is an article that's on uh, Building Sciences magazine um, that Steve Hagen and I wrote. So what's next? I think uh, maybe this, Dennis, before you leave, uh, we could jump into this. But we really want to hear how, what you think of this. And the FedIFM um, sandbox is accessible through Max. 
uh, for developers and vendors and consultants that are interesting, interested in seeing, not only seeing that, we, we don't want to just, just be a show and tell. We want to see what you can do with it. So we don't, we, we, we'd love to tell you all about what's going on, but we want to find the teams out there that are ready to show us what they can do with this. We can open this up to, to you to do that. We can do it through RESTful web services. We can talk about what's going on next with the, the sprints. Uh, we want to hear your ideas on it. Uh, but today, we wanted to kind of go quickly around the room uh, before we, we take off and kind of just hear a few things, yes, no, maybe, maybe next year. Or Dennis, I know you already, we already are starting to interact with you and, and Trimble on this. So I think there is definitely interest out there. Uh, and for those online, uh, if you can just please type into your chat box, we want to kind of get it for the record of who's out there that's ready to go to the next phase with this. Um, so Den maybe we'll start with you. Uh, yeah, I mean, te technically it seems straightforward. Um, I, I guess I'm curious about in this sandbox mode, and I've got to go back to our, our folks and see if, um, you know, developing this uh, this fed up, uh, the, the max uh, compliance, uh, authentication compliance, I mean, if that's the first step we need to do to play, that that could be just a play that could be um, problematic. Uh, I don't know. Um, as opposed to go to deployment, that's a whole different story, right? Um, and I can see lots of applications. And um, so, yeah, and I can see lots of use cases. So I don't think, um, I, you know, I, I think we're, we're ready to, to pursue at least sort of technically what the next step is. And of course, um, you know, we're going to want to get some sense of what the what the kind of opportunity is around this but I think that's a different in some ways it's a different trajectory right I mean right. in some ways we build it and then we have to sell it to get yeah. us to, to government that's I think we're, we're ready to, to try that okay well, right. one of the big and I'm not going to take too much time here but just for everybody as we're going through this if you do make a decision that you're not interested or you don't want to play it would be interesting to us to understand why. Because if it's just not in your business model, that's one thing. But if it's because we have a technical issue, I, you know, to give Andy Schoenbach uh, some credit, he, he, he has bent over backwards to try and make mm -hmm. this stuff work. He is an awesome partner. Yeah. And if, if we know what the problems are, uh, I have found with him that we can find a solution to fix these things if we need to. So uh, I, I know we want to get around the room, so not to drag it out, but if, if you do have feedback, you know, you're not going to do it because of X, Y, Z. If you're willing to share that with us, it would be helpful. Okay, and let me, just, let me just understand. So there is, I mean, the next step is kind of, you're going to issue some sort of challenge, and you're going to have a sandbox with documentate, minimal documentation, and we'll come up with some sort of use case of interaction with that. That, that's one way. We could work on it together. It's really quite wide open, but what you saw with the, there's two ways that the RESTful web services are getting into the actual code and doing something with it uh, and everything else in between. Or to show how your app, you know, we, we can go, go through that. We, we don't have any kind of uh, rigid approach. I, I, I'm a big fan of doing the challenges, to be honest with you. I, I, I think that gives, it yeah. gives uh, flexibility to people to demonstrate what they can do in real terms for us and helps us make better decisions. Yeah, I mean, that's, I just, I'm not personally, I don't know this very minute what the architectural requirements to support, you know, multiple authentication, you know, uh, max, up, max up authentication will be for us today and, and if whether or not we can get in four weeks. Or. Right. Come on, you might give Lars a chance. I know he has Oh, yeah, to Lars has to leave too. Right? Yeah, you just like to say anything, Lars? Oh, from, uh, from does everyone know Lars? Is it, is I, I think you were out of the room when the introductions came. Oh, so yeah. Why don't you share just with oh, thank you. Um, I'm working with uh, several government organizations in Norway, and uh, actually in uh, the municipality of Bergen, there is actually an initiative ongoing to develop um, uh, a system based on open source. And I think some of the ideas that uh, you're working on here are really interesting also for, for the Scandinavian environment. So um, I was here um, uh, today, I had a meeting yesterday, and uh, I had the opportunity to have a follow-up 
this meaning to value, and I will try to, to bring that this at least value to, to, to an all and, and try to grow some interest because this, I think, has a, a huge potential. An interesting thing also is that I, I think it has opened the, the, the marketplace for the uh, Catherine Sunnis and Vendors too. It's really good. So I think this is very promising. Does anybody else need to leave in a few minutes, or can we just go around? Just keep going, I guess. Um. Yeah, but I mean, I have to leave before also. But we, we don't, we're very, very new to this space. So really, I just came to, to learn in here. It sounds like waiting is a good idea. Sometimes it's getting a whole lot easier for commercial vendors to work with the federal government. This is really very important. Go from there. Yeah, from an ESRI's perspective, I think we're, we're kind of jumped in a little bit already and, and, and did, did the initial group concept. Um, and so there's, there's a team that's kind of knowledgeable and taking some of that challenge up. Um, and I think we're just eager to figure out where it goes from there. So certainly we're in that agnostic side of, you know, we're on Opera Web Services, uh, Amazon Web Services, we're on Azure, we're on you know, it's going to be on our ballpark to see what it takes to put on Max and how do we get our products um, supported there and, and, and stood up there. Um, but so far we've been able to connect the dots and use very simple JavaScript APIs to, to create and ingest all that data and show it to our clients on So and you were able to do that without making Esri Max FM authentication compliant, is that right? I believe so. That's yes. right. It was the open uh, RESTful yes. web server. Okay, yeah. great. Yeah. Yeah, that's you, you also might mention what you Esri has done in Roslyn. You have some sort of open data center? Yes, we've got a, a, an open data center um, in our development technology center here in Roslyn. And, uh, so they've been looking at different data standards and um, and ways to pass data back and forth and, and um, a whole variety of different ways. They've been playing a lot of different spaces. So we're, we're very eager to figure out you know, um, how do we open up systems and, and leverage our technology. Yeah, again, not to take up too much time, but just, you know, this is sort of in, in the Catham side of the house for us. Uh, Having 150 servers where we distribute stuff makes dealing with the cap side a lot easier. One of the biggest things we are struggling with right now is how do we integrate that across the entire enterprise because the mass of information when we start moving into the visual side uh, is becoming a, a pretty big challenge. So not to go into any more detail, but just so you know, we're gonna some of the next steps are gonna be heavy in that venue trying to look at big yeah, at least, you know, from our perspective, what's big? 70 million square feet and more of, of inventory. And I think, I think as an action item, I think one of the things we need to do is very specific use cases. Right. Once you implement a challenge, and I think we need to think broadly as well as deep. Right. Um, because, you know, we can prove that we can connect the dots, but there are some very serious challenges with large buildings, large data, large visualizations that's more than just a simple dot on that. Oh yeah, definitely. And, and one retrieving one piece of information. What is the general use case that an executive or the various users you had up there um, need to implement? So I think we'd be interested in understanding what those are. Definitely, yeah. Okay, great. I'm uh, Jeff Fitzgerald, Jacobs Engineering. I'm here to make people learn. But uh, this is uh, in front of me. We're all in because we can model the software. I believe the software, as you said, it does very specific things, but it consumes the data and acquires metadata that's compliant with their system. And I think it's going to be a big hole for many more organizations to overcome this. Showing the areas of efficiency that we wrestle with 
matter what your client size is, whether it's a federal client or our education clients, trying to get to one database that you can have all of your enterprise systems feeding off of and provide valuable information. How we then take that uh, and participate in the sandbox, there are a lot of details to be understood, which I personally don't have, but uh, at a high level, I think it's important to seriously take a look at also need to collaborate with the folks over at Esri to get an understanding of what they've done so far because our, our endpoint solutions are based on their technology. So really understanding how we can fit into this uh, is going to be uh, what's next for me is working with whoever I can figure out here to understand where we want to go and how we can do this. Great. I'll, uh follow up on that because my, on my board now I'm a, a writer, I'm trying to communicate to uh, other agencies the value of jumping on with this and to other vendors and, and just to make it uh, a little bit more accessible and I'm struggling. So I'm going to want to talk with each of you and try to figure out how to put together something. Simone's got the great images, there, there's a wealth of knowledge, but I'll, I'm going to try to figure out how to make it a little bit more accessible. Great. Gary? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. We already know what Mike's. <laughs> Mike's on board. So, I, again, I'm not over it so 
solution. I'm, I'm raising the question of let's play that all that, right? Because you will, you will hear it not from me, but from the others that, right? Um, just, I, you know, I'm having every week I have another call with somebody at GSA who has to go. So the second thing I hear is what actually scared me is when uh, Russ said, uh, you cannot pull data from our database in your software. You need to build the software to deal with our existing database. Maybe you mentioned something different, because what you actually said is that we all need to build new solutions that will work with your data structure as the major source, not using new, not using the web services to bring the data into our applications, processing, and send something to those back. I think that, if what you said is true, because every vendor will have to build a new software, again, custom software, just for was well, this Fed IFM thing? Uh, it's a major investment, no software available to them, unless they pay millions of dollars. So, if it's a restful service that is open and everybody can plug and play, that's fine. Uh, everybody, as I said, most of the, we integrated probably 14 or 15 various FM applications. Credit for that, no plan on it, I don't know. Uh, as for the headset. So, all of them have some kind of uh, API. Web services mostly sometimes will be seen, but most of them have API. So it is doable to exchange data, perform some business logic on, on inside of your software. And then the, the other challenge will be is that if you will say, no, you need to use our structure to build your new application, then who is developing that new structure? Because it's a major problem. Right? You, may, you may hire one or two architects, and then the other comes in and says, no, this structure is wrong. You know? so, you will create a massive, another Timos, pretty much. Timos right. with the web interface. So, um, what, what we're talking about doing, though, is not, I mean, we're talking about sharing it through RESTful services. So, yeah. we're, are, are we in alignment with what he's saying, or? It's, it's, I'm not it's a hybrid approach. I don't think it's an all or nothing, because it's all, like Igor says, there are solutions out there that have their own structure right now. What we're looking for is what, and APIs exist, like you said, so there's a lot of things that are possible today. Um, so the question on, on the rebuilding of demos is, do we build this structure and then build applications on top of it, or do we look for other applications that exist that can plug into it, or is there an off-the-shelf application that can replace it? And that's the evaluation, basically, the point that we're at right now. Yeah, so, I, I mean, it, it would be, that's good feedback, and it's something we're going to have to work through because at the end of the day, this is a pipe dream if it's not viable to the industry, right? And, and I acknowledge that. So one of the reasons we want to have this dialogue is so that we can understand what is viable and what isn't. But I do want to put out there that the point I was trying to make is security is, there are a lot of things we don't do just because we know we can't get it through security, whether we want to or not. Yeah, and if the model is you have to absorb all of our data to do anything, it's, it's, no, it's, it's a non-starter, no, but no, I don't no, think no, that's no, what we're talking no, about. No, nobody no, 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 exchanges all the data when you do the integration. There's a, there's a lot of, um, you don't exchange even 10% of what the typical because there's a, a lot of internal data that is pretty much useless for the exchange. Yeah. Um, and it's all again, it's driven by business use cases. Um, we didn't discuss a lot of technology, but we really didn't discuss any business use cases. You know? the, the other, I mean, okay, next. Next is the uh, fragmentation or balkanization of the workflows. Um, it's nice to show that how easy it is to create a single work order, and yes, a typical developer can create a work order system mm -hmm. in one week. But at the same time, there are, you know, you guys have been working on about 20 years? Yes. Uh, maximum 30 years? Yeah. Yeah. So, a lot of big companies have been spending decades on building a better and better and better system. Because it's not just about creating a lot of them. So what, what I'm afraid is that sometimes if you will present to the industry like, oh, you know, anybody can sell that us and now you work with it, you will get uh, something like similar to Excel tables and Microsoft Access tables all the 10, 15 years ago. As you guys know, there's everybody's going to try to actually reduce the number of the applications, right? Because the, you know, it's a, you know, the Army Navy contract for internet has 3,000 financial applications. 
because somebody said, oh, it doesn't work for me, that SAP for people so. Uh, so I will do my own actual taxes database. So you guys need to try to avoid that here because if you will create that, then CIOs will just kill it immediately because they say, oh, now I will support you know, 200 more quarter management systems because this guy likes big button and this guy <laughs> likes small button. We once lost the contract uh, because we were presenting our software and uh, the guys were asking one technician, or uh, like two, three technicians, the technician said, I like that other software more. It has four buttons and they say that almost has 12. <laughs> um, so it's not a serious uh, distribution. You know, so, so I'm not working with this issue because um, I think, again, you guys have a great thing with the security, uh, but there are there will be major business issues that you need to have big guys involved, like I mentioned, the you know, like IBM staff, the others, Archivus, um, and see what, what their feedback will be because um, half of the government are using their systems. And, uh, but in terms of the open interfaces, the rest of the APIs, that's great. You know, every vendor that is here will support us. Right. I think that's the first step. And then the bigger picture, obviously, there's a lot of challenges like you talked about. but having this discussion, having a place to actually test it, what does work, what doesn't work, and it could be that a vendor's, uh, one of the larger solutions could be part of the, 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 the overall solution as long as we think in terms of, okay, it's how do we get more of the data in and out to other parts of the whole life cycle? And I think some of that discussion is already happening with Kobe and it's all starting there, but how do we bump it up to the next level so it's not a constant import, export, or export only, import only a one-way system. We wanted to really close that loop as much as possible. And it's not going to be something that happens overnight. It's going to be a hybrid kind of a incremental approach. But we, th we think this is the effort that's been put into here and the fact that DOD MHS funded this actually got us to this level to even have this discussion. And I think now it's kind of our opportunity as an industry to say, okay, what's realistic, what really works, and what can we all benefit from it? As an architect, I see a immediate value to being able to access owner data directly instead of spending weeks and months crawling through a building and getting the data. And this is what we've constantly been talking about at Building Smart. So just that use case alone, I think, is a value. How do you get the data unlocked from behind this firewall and get it available to consultants by itself, I think, is a value. Now, there's a lot of other things. There's a lot of other challenges. But that's Igor, you always have great input, so I appreciate that. And, you know, Igor, I think one of the things that I want to stress, you know, not just for you, but for everybody, is if, if you don't participate in the dialogue of this moving forward, uh, we may not be aware of some of this stuff, you know, so, it, yeah, yeah, no, I know, I, I'm just trying to say come back, right? <laughs> 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 you know? Yeah. I have a crazy question. Um, do, you, do you envision app development um, always being triggered by a conventional procurement process, or is it possible that it could be an app store environment that developers create apps at risk and then sell them to a government agency? I, you know, I think this has the potential to do that. I, um, you know, I think some of the construct of how we move forward, to be honest with you, in, in my mind, I, I think that's a component of what we're trying to do. Because I, as, as Igor said, some of these big players, I don't, I'm not looking to get rid of the big players because right. they spend a lot of money figuring out how to do this stuff very well. What I'm trying to figure out is how I can harness the best of each of them and stick them together right. and make it work. Those are very big apps, but I think some of the little things we need to do, big players, there's no business case in it them so they're never going to develop it but we still need to do it I, I mean are we going to be uh, Apple App Store business case you know I don't see that ever happening and, and I do support your vision because uh, these the vendors they still are good at something in particular even if they have modules for other things there's mm -hmm. no vendor that is good at everything like all of us know right yeah. so and both IBM and Archibus and other major players they're still are perfect because they work, it's all about who you work with, right? You, if you work with the um, space management folks, most of all, that's going to be your expertise. If you work with the maintenance folks, that's going to be your major expertise. Even if you have space management, no one's going to use it. 
like I don't know, you might work for a management project because you know, that's not my business. So uh, at the same time, making the government aware of these point solutions and making them work together with major players, that's going to be uh, helpful. Because we are all, all myself and others, we are creating specific you know, point solutions that are best of breed, and that's what can uh, help all of us. So, uh, Real quickly, your comments you made me think about uh, Searle and Builder and these other kinds of uh, engineering and analytical applications. Have you guys addressed their compliance with this White House? Yeah, I, I'm not going to tell you the level of effort we're going through with Builder right now. We, we are, com we're, we in the MHS. Uh, started, it's a three year effort for us, but we l we'll probably, we're probably ahead of the pack a little bit, maybe not the Marines, but pretty much everybody else in the DOD. We're going through and completely uh, doing a builder assessment of every single asset we have. I mean, I, right now, today, I think I have six teams around the world right now assessing stuff, and I've got, we're going to ramp up to nine teams of people at one point all over the globe for the next two years, just doing nothing but builder compliance. And what, what, what classification are you using Omni class? What classification are you using for the assets? Um, Uniformat is, Uniform. yeah, is what the, so I mean, technically, you know, that's a subset of Omni class, right? So I guess you could say we were doing that, but we just went through a massive overhaul of demos because the way we classified stuff in DIMLs was unique to the MHS. Yeah. So we just converted DIMLs over to Uniformat so that we could integrate the two together. But we, we knew when we started down the builder road that there's no way we were going to pull builder into DIMLs and make it a subset of DIMLs. It just isn't going to happen. And my bosses said, look, we can't have two sets of the same information. We can't even keep one up to date. How are we going to do two? So we're I'm not saying we completely cracked the nut on this, but we are integrating the exchange of information between Dimmels and Builder. Uh, we're working heavily with Serral. I, I mean, we're their, probably their biggest user right now, so yeah, we have the attention. Yeah, I think there's other agencies that have the same. Yeah, well, you know, par you know partnering in, in the DOD yeah, is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, we're, our communication is through Serral. I, I mean, it's not that we don't want to, it's just there's not enough hours in the day. Yeah. You know? okay. Going back to a comment that Michael, you brought up the idea of the app store uh, concept. I think I anticipate there's a, there's a place in this whole blend where, while it wouldn't be an app store, the developing small modules or small apps come under the threshold of, of discretionary budgets that, that small mm -hmm. groups will have within the government fund. And, that, and so that those will be able to be developed on a small scale, then they can be introduced into a mass environment and be recognized by other agencies. I, so I, I think there is a component yeah, to that in this overall strategy. I, I don't, Igor, please don't take this as an insult, right? But Igor is not the size of, of Maximo, right? So in that concept. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> there you go. In that concept, you know, in my mind, when I look at an app, Igor's. Igor's tool is an application that I think he does a lot of good things. I've gotten in the way of a couple contracts that he's tried to do within the MHS only because it causes an enterprise problem for me because of our current situation. If we get to what we're talking about, it now, from an enterprise standpoint, makes Igor's solution a viable solution set for us. Hey, if you were warning from me, yeah, he's happy. <laughs> 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 but, you know, I mean, that, so I, I look at all of these small, large, medium, whatever the case is, as applications, and in this environment, it gives us the flexibility to harness them. In the world I live in today, one of the reasons we have demos is because as good as Maximo is, as good as TMA is, as good as Archibus is, it doesn't do everything we need it to do, and we can't afford to, to spend so much money on something that does maybe 75% of what we need, and then we don't, we can't do the other 25%. We don't have the choice not to do that other 25%. So we take, we take and build a system that does everything half well for everybody. <laughs> and uh, I think another thing relating to what Igor, what you were saying is, 
um, the existing established applications have been built over the years with a lot of effort and thought to how to yeah. connect these pieces together. So they've evolved to that point, that workflow. Wor that workflow. But on the other hand, too, they've also built a business case around that, yeah. and there's been no question or reason to talk about can we break modules off more, for example, or give more access. And the APIs do, do, do help that. But I think having this kind of a challenge and a request might help change the discussion and might help um, smaller vendors as well to find a place to get to get in there whereas like Russ said there's no place to go in right now and, and the the modular development strategy in the White House actually outlines this exactly it says right now it's only there's only one way to do it and it's always this huge long effort that 95% of the time fails and then you start that effort again so that just it's kinda just craziness as we all know so how do we how do we shift the discussion make it a win-win for everybody and we don't have all the answers right now, and that's why we're, <laughs> we want input. Um, but I think we have a place to test it and, and a place that is actually viable as far as a way to approach it. And, and, and again, I can't speak for the whole DOD, and I'm not going to speak for every partner that's working with us, but there is no app. We know we have to, probably a better way for me to say it is we know we have a problem with Dimmel's FM that has to be resolved. There's no appetite in our organization. Um, to go through the contracting mess of trying to get something like Archibus Maximo or TMA implemented when we know it can't do everything we need it to do and it is going to be a massive contracting effort as well as probably a legal effort that would get challenged no matter who gets picked and how good they are and how clean we are in the contracting effort because it's going to be a massive commitment that for better or worse nobody wants to lose. I mean, we're Air Force Next Gen is selecting Maximo. Here we are five years in. No, nothing on board yet. And VA's so, in the same boat. Yeah, VA's in the same boat. Um, and for the same reasons. Same, same reasons. Um, you know, part of, I think, what's going to happen coming back to the moment disruptive technologies. Not only do we have disruptive <coughs> technologies going on, we have disruption in the workforce coming now at a massive scale where you figure that almost all the maintenance workforce is retirement eligible and we're not finding enough young folks to come on to replace just the technician level, much less the senior um, maintenance manager or supervisor levels. So you're going to have to look at the technology now as a mechanism to help you solve this emerging workforce issue. And they're not going to know how to go sit at a client server and navigate that screen because that's, that's not what they grew up with, right? So if we say, okay, Michael, if you got a, can you come up with an app that does this, and the guys in the field say, yeah, I need to be able to do this, and in four weeks, you have something out there, that's the business model. Yeah, yeah. the young folks in the workforce are actually taking their iPads and other things and finding their own workarounds. And that's right. Mm -hmm. and, you know, if that means disassociating from the traditional CMS capital, I was just seeing the challenge here is um, about 10 years ago, I heard one CEO of Kitchen uh, Nation, the home builder, they were yeah. speaking in front of the home yeah. yeah. association and say, no, guys, right. I'll tell you, SAP sucks because we did this $50 million implementation that's and it's failed to all of this blow up. Uh, I don't say anything really about that about the software, it just talks about the specific implementation. So, mm -hmm. yes, maximum for Air Force maybe five years behind the schedule, but Okay, what they're having problem is standing up instances, okay, because of the configuration and the cost of data conversion. But, but they, when the con, you know, the, the point where this came up was that there's no, the, the opportunity that's lost because we can't do this decoupling of data, there's no appetite for folks to go through the process of even contracting some of this stuff because even with VA, even though, you know, it, it ended up, it still went to Maximo, they got it awarded the first time, then it got challenged, and then they had to stop and relook and there is a whole mess in there and you know five years later not that Maximo is a bad product that's not where I was going with any of that uh, what what happens 
is because of everything that's involved in that kind of commitment in this con the current construct we live in makes it almost a guaranteed failure for many of us in the federal government. The scale alone is the barrier. Yeah. Right. Well, yeah. Now, in the VA's case, they had 21 businesses. Now they can come up with an enterprise solution, and then the 21 business won. Yeah. So, right. Yeah. 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 The, the other thing is organizational culture. Um, I worked on a project at HHS uh, with uh, Unified Financial Management. The VA had had it before Barry Point was the integrator, and it was an utter failure. And the failure wasn't Barry Point's fault. It wasn't uh, the, the um, uh, fault of the software that they that they selected. Uh, it was the, the VA culture. The people that had to use it in the field would not go to the training and could not be made to go to the training because of union issues, because it had to be overtime. And therefore, they didn't know, so they had to call Bearing Point in to operate the system. It, it blew up on them. And who got blamed? Well, you can't blame the, the civil service, so you, blame, you can't blame the management, so you blame the contractor. So that, you know, I mean, but, but, but the, the software uh, was fine, you know, the, the implementation was fine. You are talking about, interestingly enough, a business process re-engineering yeah. issue with this, with this thing. And I would encourage you to look at it as a VPR. Because, for example, they take a very simple example. A request goes in for work order. Embedded in the request has to be the facility, the location, the area, the piece of equipment that is in, you know, the chiller or whatever it is that you know, do so. So there have to be tags or identifications. That data has to go out to the system that's going to write the work order. That system has to also contain, based on that location and area, available technicians, technician level, special tools, um, any training that had to have gone on, who has that specialized training, and there are parts. Right, parts from the repair center, I'm getting there. <laughs> <laughs> and and, and all of that is within, the, is within the database, okay? Now, to operate on that, that app, then it's not just you know six or eight or ten variables. It is that demo screen that you show, which looks a lot like uh, Archibus. It looks a lot like TMA. It looks a lot like Maxima, because those are the variables that you have that you have to do. There are inferentially there are ways to streamline that, but the big question that I asked was. What of the data, when it goes out, you've got a system there, so it's going to go out to your app, okay? But some of that legacy data is going to be, is going to be left, metadata is going to be left in the app. And the question is, what is the level of security required in that metadata? In other words, the, the classic example was the Japanese bomb Pearl Harbor, okay? And we're planning an attack to take over Midway Island which would have given them a solid base aircraft carrier in the middle of the Pacific from which to launch long-range bombers and control the whole Pacific for years. All right, because we were just getting into the war. We didn't have ships. They missed our three carriers. And well, we had four. One got sunk at Coral Sea. I mean, this is a fabulous story. So the, the, the American intelligence is trying to find out what's the next Japanese target. They suspected Midway. So they had Midway radio a message that said their water system was on the fritz, in the clear. And they got a message, they intercepted a message and they decoded the Japanese that said AK-10's water chiller. Is it. And they knew, having translated it, that that was Midway. And that was what they had seen the chatter about, was about that target. Okay, We ambushed them at Midway and not not them halfway back across the Pacific to Japan. There are tactical issues on in your facilities. If you have an outbreak of something, or if you're in a battle situation, or you're getting casualties back that inform an enemy. Yeah. So to the to the so point to, to the point that you're making, though. Yeah. To the point that you're making, though. 
one of the reasons I keep talking about that green box being outside the application is there's a hard reality we're going to have to live with, and everybody in the federal government is going to have to live with this. The, the more that we have to stick in the black box to make the black box work, the more of a security risk we have, and the more likely we are we're going to have to pull it inside the firewall. If we have to pull you inside the firewall, it defeats a lot of what we're trying to do. Correct. And so it's something we're going to have to work through, but in this construct, what we're talking about doing minimizes the amount of data that has to be outside of the system, which makes what we're talking about viable. There's, there, there's going to have to be a balance, and that balance will ebb and flow based on the security posture. It's the reality of the world we live in. And I'd rather have a lot of metadata that's encrypted spread across a multitude of mobile devices where that Japanese commander has to get a piece from every one of my things to get full scope. And that's, that's the profile that we're shooting for now. In our current architecture, we cannot achieve that. Right. Because it's all or nothing now. Yeah. We, we ran over quite a bit. Um, and I know there's a lot more questions. In fact, we have questions that came online, and I don't know if we're going to be able to address them. Some of them, we'll, we'll list them and put them all out there. Um, but I think we might have to wrap up because we have another meeting with we'll Andy here. Summary, yeah, yeah, we will, we will do that. Um, I guess we, oh, we didn't hear from you, Jason. Do you yeah, want to say anything quickly? Two folks who didn't have yeah, two. Yeah. How, much, how much time do you want to give me? <laughs> Seriously. Couple, couple start, start talking. <laughs> um, so, I'll, I'll sum it up. So, my, so, one thing, when we as a contract, when we're looking to do what we do, we look for problems. So, I mean, this is, this is an architecture, and it's like you can do things, you can create a work order system, but we are delivering something, whether we're delivering equipment, whether we're delivering design, whether we're delivering construction. And a lot of times our client, the clients come to us and say, we need to be able to do something. We need to then solve that problem. So if we have access to the information and we can build our own tool set in order to be able to deliver something more efficiently, that's what we want to be able to do. So this open structure where we can consume information that helped us solve very specific problems. So I'll go with one very quick here. So for a hospital, someone has to specify the equipment level, the steps, what will have to go in there. Then someone has to create a design intent, which is a translation of the data. And then someone has to go create what you're actually going to go buy. And then someone actually has to go purchase all that information. Then it has to be turned over to the facility, which then has to then know exactly what I had in order to be able to operate and maintain it. There's four translations of that information. To the, and that is so important to us. And we're one of the top five equipment planners in the world that we built our own proprietary system, that we then go hand jam information from the clients into our system and then deliver it back to them and they end up using our own proprietary system, which is system to be able to actually end up ma maintaining things on the back end. We would much rather, much, much rather can the data side of that and just be able to consume the information and translate along our own way to achieve our results and then give it back to you. So this is, it fits exactly into where we want to be able to create adaptive solutions to meet individual agency or even project needs. So that's, I mean, this fits exactly into where our industry is evolving to deliver custom solutions to our client. And that's what we're going to do. We're not trying to solve the world. We're trying to solve a problem for a client on a specific project. That's what we're hired to do. We're not looking way up across all of the agencies and everything. So if an agency wants us to do something, we need to be able to have the, the most tools at our disposal and be able to do that. So that's that's what I want to be able to see is what our back to my original point. Tell me what um, the agencies need to create. We just have work order systems as an example. Well, what do you need to solve? And that's what we can actually come in and help you guys out testing things that what workflow can we now go to improve? Uh, so Walter Reed. So I'll flash up there. I think we spent six to eight months reconciling contracts and equipment. A team of people, six to eight months, just doing nothing that we were paid for it. We we're happy to do the work. Uh, we owed money for it, uh, but I'm sure the government and us, I know we would rather than that in six to eight days uh, and not been paid for the six to eight months. So I mean, those are the problems that we might be able to solve. Stuff that keeps us at a, on a project resolving problems for Great. Anybody else? Oh, we um, I, I think Dennis already spoke oh, about you're with Dennis. development, but I, I would say um, 
my experience with your technology has been more in the construction sector than the FM. I just came off the Facebook project, Facebook campus expansion, um, uh, during the construction sector. And we used two uh, mobile applications from startups, Plan Grid and Been Anywhere. And being able, just this is something that's come up a couple of times, being able to come up to a big tank of information and siphon off actionable information that then you can hand out to foremen and supers and all these people. They don't need to be able to necessarily fill out like the format for a punch list or something like that, but just being able to deliver actionable information from a much larger, it changes the, the way that you communicate. And so I think that's exciting you know, for this because you don't necessarily need to have a, a hyper-trained technician if you can hand something over that's relatively intuitive and everybody's consuming from that information whereas previously it wasn't accessible. Like, it has the potential to really uh, accelerate use. And, you know, also, it feeds back into the fidelity of that information and more people making sure that what you have in your database is actually correct as it's going back and forth in the field. So they're constantly living off the live data, so they're constantly living in the data. Exactly. OK, so with that, I think we're going to adjourn. We have to jump into another meeting, which we were 30 minutes behind with the Max team here. Um, but I appreciate everybody's input and attendance and keep the comments coming. Uh, go to the fedifm.org site. We're going to keep updating that with information. We'll share the notes that we have from today. And online, for the people online, sorry we didn't get to your questions, but we will uh, address them. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.